morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is our regular Wednesday opportunity to visit with uh, you and the press. It's part of our uh, ongoing communication plan uh, that we instituted during the crisis uh, when it first began, knowing that uh, there would be a lot of questions in the community about uh, how the hospital was doing, how the community was doing, and our effort to provide uh, some data and uh, transparency around that information. So thanks for coming here again. I want to start with a kind of a heartwarming story that happened yesterday. I was just out in the afternoon uh, walking the hall saying hello to some folks and uh, a couple of nurses stopped me and said, hey, Dr. K, you ought to go out front and see those folks holding the signs. And there was a set of grandparents that had driven up from uh, McPherson to uh, visit their daughter who had a, a baby and they were holding signs out in front welcoming the grandchild into the world and and uh, it was a real joyous occasion for them that uh, to me it kind of demonstrated uh, our ability to adapt uh, they were outside because of our visit visiting policy uh, right now is limiting uh, to the number of folks that can be in and yet they were full of this joy around this event and uh, there's a sign for all of us I think in the hope of a newborn the kind of potential that exists in a newborn as we begin to contemplate um, a reopening uh, getting back towards a new normal whatever that looks like uh, a lot of positive energy in our uh, organization now thinking about reopening, uh, reopening, uh, re uh, making uh, elective surgeries available, and re reopening our clinics. So our intention is to begin uh, on May 4th with uh, both the clinics and uh, elective surgeries in uh, two locations at our same-day surgery center and excellent uh, surgery center and then uh, across uh, the clinic spectrum. Uh, with one hesitation, we're not sure that we'll be open on uh, Monday in Emporia. They're still dealing with a pretty significant outbreak in that community, so uh, not sure that we're quite ready to open there. In the clinics, uh, our goal is going to be to start at about a 50% of our usual capacity, um, and that'll allow us to do the appropriate social distancing in the waiting rooms and uh, making sure that um we do this responsibly. There will be door screeners uh, also uh, that will help to regulate the, uh, the people in the building, uh, keeping track of who's in and who's out, making sure that we uh, are able to maintain that social distancing. Uh, we are going to continue to limit those with heart and lung disease and diabetes and those over 65 in all of the reopening plans that we've seen. Uh, all the various stages until the very end. It recommends that those that are most vulnerable uh, continue to shelter in place as much as possible. So we will uh, try to make that happen for those people. We are still here to deal with all the urgent and emergent care that needs to happen. But for those things that can be done uh, by telemedicine, uh, for those people in particular, we want to make sure that that happens. Uh, similarly, in uh, our surgery center, uh, we actually are going to be opening those on uh, Monday. Uh, we will have all patients come through the uh, drive-through testing ahead of that, so we'll have a negative test result when we see them for surgery. Uh, again, we'll be working through the social distancing, knowing that some of those, uh, some of those that are waiting uh, for uh, their loved ones that are having surgery may have to wait in their cars. Uh, we have some space uh, for that waiting, but uh, we're going to manage that the best we can uh, so that we maintain the appropriate social distancing. Same uh, restrictions, uh, carefully screening those patients so that those that are most vulnerable uh, will not 
uh, be screened in for those procedures. Um, we've expanded the hours for both of those surgical locations uh, so that uh, we can deal uh, with what we believe has been a backlog of uh, patient need. Uh, that does bring up a, another point that I think uh, my colleague at, at uh, KU St. Francis brought up in the paper is that uh, there, are, there is a lot of uh, what we believe is delayed care for people that have urgent or emergent uh, needs. We took care of a five-day-old uh, myocardial infarction last week. We took care of a two-day-old uh, stroke. And in both those cases, those patients would have benefited by coming in early and getting their care early. And so it's uh, really important for people to understand that the hospital is a safe place, that we have done all the things necessary so that people are safe when they come here, including cohorting of uh, COVID patients, all the various testing we do, the, all the protective gear we wear, uh, and all the extra cleaning that we do to make sure it's a safe place for all patients. So uh, I want to, uh, again, join Mr. Anderson in, in uh, that message that the hospitals are safe and we need to care for those people that need the care and, uh, and hopefully people will not delay that kind of needed care. We talked a little bit last week about in-house testing. Uh, we did receive our allotment uh, that we were hoping for and have uh, reassurances um, as good as that is, but we've been reassured that we'll continue to receive a regular allotment. Right now, that amount uh, of tests, those number of tests, uh, we have prioritized to uh, patients that come through the emergency department that are suspect for COVID, uh, those that, uh, again, are uh, potentially uh, suspects uh, for COVID that require emergent surgery, and uh, all the ICU admits uh, will uh, have a test that'll be a rapid test. And so that's that's the limit of that, that allotment currently we hope to get more and more as as time goes on and as they become available um, in this <coughs> excuse me in all of this uh, journey telemedicine has come to the front as being uh, a vital part of uh, how we deliver care that is going to be the case in the future continuously I think and I uh, want to applaud and thank uh, CMS and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, uh, our two major payers that are currently reimbursing at 100% of the, the uh, reimbursement as if it were a face-to-face. -face. My personal opinion is that that um, has facilitated the spread and use of telemedicine and it will also facilitate the continued use of telemedicine into the future and it needs to be a part, uh, a full uh, part of our uh, ability to deliver services. So uh, again, a shout out to Blue Cross and CMS and other pairs that have taken that on. And it is our strong uh, desire and, and our belief that that continuing into the future will be necessary to continue to hold on to the gains that we've achieved in telemedicine. So with that, just a few uh, statistics. Um, we have currently five in-house uh, inpatient COVID positive patients. Uh, Twelve patients have recovered and been discharged that have had COVID. We're close to 2,900 tests administered to date. At the exact number is 2,893. We've completed over 18,000 uh, virtual care appointments and we have currently 32 team members that are in uh, contact leave. Um, and I wanna underscore again our gratitude to the community for all the donations that have been made. And as we begin to consider opening up, uh, I wanna again give a shout out to our entire region, and particularly our community and the leadership that we've had at the state and local and uh, county that have uh, facilitated the stay at home and, and dampened uh, the, the great surge of patients that we were anticipating and we look forward to um, 
to responsibly relaxing those and getting back into uh, this open up period. So with that, we'll take your questions. visits. Now I don't know actually if, if they're likely are patients that have had um, you know more than one visit so I don't know exactly the number of patients. And that's throughout Star Wars? Yes. Uh -huh. gotcha. yeah. now, that, now that you've seen um, the Shawnee County uh, ban restrictions um, how are you feeling about that as we lessen our stay-at-home orders? I'm sorry, the Shawnee County what? Uh, stay-at-home orders, how we're going to get back to normal now that you've seen their kind of step-by-step -step guidelines. Yes. What's your takeaway on that? Are you feeling confident that that is an appropriate approach? Yeah, I'm, I have 100% confidence in uh, our county the, and Dr. Pizzino and the, the efforts he's led uh, and uh, the state as well. Um, it's a difficult calculus really to make. There is obviously a great deal of energy and desire to, to begin to open things up, a great need economically to open things up, and you balance that uh, against the safety of uh, those that are most vulnerable uh, to the virus. Um, it is uh, almost a certainty that we'll see more cases. And um, so it's, it, it's in every instance, as a, in every stage until such time as there is a, a really uh, effective and widespread use of, of a vaccine, uh, in each case, uh, the most vulnerable still need to be uh, socially distanced. So, um, but I have confidence in people are making those decisions. As you plan to reopen now, so what have, have you guys talked about team members pay getting back to that 100% from the board? Yes. So, uh, we have begun to, to think through what what will be the kind of the target, what will be the threshold, what will, when will we know that we're able to, to get back to that. We're watching uh, our uh, financial performance very closely, and uh, so I can't tell you exactly when, but we're monitoring and hoping to get back to that time um, as soon as possible. And what all have you guys done for mental health for these nurses and doctors that are on the front lines? Oh goodness, uh, so we've made available uh, many opportunities through our behavioral health um, offerings, uh, various uh, telephone, uh, various appointments, various ways to access support. And then we've done a lot of the more soft things of, you know, we have a, a relaxed dress code right now. We have uh, a music that comes on at noon. Um, we have uh, various supports through our spiritual care uh, team. So uh, we have that in focus. And have you heard about any problem at all? Oh, I think uh, not any specific, but generally, uh, especially at the beginning, when we were first dealing with it, there was a lot of fear and anxiety, uh, completely justified. And as we've gotten into it and people have become used to wearing the protective gear appropriately and have conf more confidence in each other, uh, there's much less fear and it's more kind of matter of fact and a professional approach. And um, so um, I th there's still a fair amount of concern and anxiety, I think, but much less than there was. And um, going back for a second to you know, reopening the elective surgeries and stuff like that, um, just so I have it straight, is it elective surgeries and all elective appointments that are going to go back? I'm sorry, say it again. I'm having a hard time. Sorry, is it all elective surgeries and all elective appointments that are going to be taking that much? Right. So the elective surgeries start in two locations, and then the elective appointments, the clinic appointments, will begin also across all the clinic with the exception of uh, the location in Emporia, we haven't yet made that decision. Haven't, uh, they're just, just kind of deciding there, uh, given the outbreak that that community has suffered. So, and, yeah. um, you know, picking back up with that, you know, how, um, how crucial is that to, to getting Stormont back to? I know you said you've kind of begun to discuss finances. How crucial is that to getting Stormont um, back on um, kind of solid ground? So um, I like to, to think 
Excuse me. I like to think of Stormont Vale as a, as a system, take a system view, and uh, when any part of that system isn't functioning at capacity, then the whole isn't functioning as well as it could. Uh, the clinic and elective surgery are vital uh, pieces of the Stormont Vale health system um, financial operation, if you will. And uh, actually, they're a piece, vital piece of the entirety, the, both clinical and financial. And so uh, getting them back to, um, to seeing electives, to being fully engaged with the care they can offer uh, are very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of back and forth about whether people can uh, get symptoms again once they've had coronavirus. Have you had any cases where someone's come back with symptoms? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we are hearing about some people are saying you can sterilize and reuse, like there's some new device you can sterilize and reuse PPE. Yep. But then the nurses association is like saying, don't do that. So what are your thoughts on that? So, um, I hadn't heard that about the Nurses Association. I do know that the state uh, got a new piece of equipment, and one of that one is going to be located here in Topeka if, uh, that can uh, sterilize masks, uh, particularly the N95s, uh, for uh, reuse. And um, there's another process where, whereby if the mask isn't soiled, you can let it sit isolated in a, in a paper bag for a period of time, and during that time that virus is deactivated and, and is reusable. So there are multiple uh, ways that people are looking at trying to reuse uh, the scarce uh, N95s. Would you guys need to do that at all? Yes, I think we're looking at both those options very seriously. When you go back to surgeries, you said you were going to test people to make sure before. Do you know how, how long after you take that test before these people, would that be something if they were going to have surgery, they need to come in like a, a day before or something like that? Or how after you after you monitor this test, obviously you want a negative test before they let them in your hospital. How long is that going to take? Well, we think it's uh, the turnaround is about two days mostly. So if they come in, uh, let's take, for instance, for Monday, the, if they get their tests on Friday and then they are very careful about the social distancing uh, and shelter at home, then we should have that test result Sunday before they come for their surgery on Monday. So uh, that's kind of the sequence we're anticipating. So I think so. Um, we are, uh, as we um, plan uh, for our clinics to be fully reopened, we are messaging that we are hoping to get to somewhere around 35% of the usual customary volume that we've had will be able to be delivered by telemedicine. That's a big goal. Um, and again, it's really dependent upon our payer partners. If CMS and Blue Cross and Blue Shield in particular uh, continue the reimbursement as it is currently, that will greatly facilitate our being able to offer those services telemedicine. And uh, there's a big convenience factor, there's a safety factor, um, there is a generational factor. Many people in your generations like to get uh, a lot of their information through their, their handheld device or through a computer or some other way electronically. And if we can facilitate that, we'd like to be able to. What do you encourage the community to do as we move into this reopening phase? So, uh, um, I think to balance uh, the strong desire to get out, to socialize, to open up businesses, and balance that with the responsibility of taking the social distancing to heart uh, and being 
careful about appropriate distances and and um, just continue to the responsible behaviors that we've seen up to this point. You're all out. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said you had a lot. No, okay. No. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys again. I appreciate you being here. How hard is it to understand this through these masks? I just think so India's good. voice is a little bit quiet, and that's why I keep saying, <laughs> and my hearing isn't as good as it should be. So it's really, really hard. It is hard. So thank you for speaking up.